Hello all, and welcome to today's online event hosted by the International Inequalities Institute and the Atlantic Fellows for Social and Economic Equity. My name is Armina Ishkanian, and I am the Executive Director of the Atlantic Fellows for Social and Economic Equity Program, which is based in the International Inequalities Institute. I'm also an Associate Professor in the Department of Social Policy at LSE. I'm incredibly pleased to be chairing this evening's keynote lecture titled Donut Economics, A New Economic Vision for Cities. In today's event, our keynote speaker, Kate Rayworth, will discuss how we can create equal and just cities without overburdening the environment. She will be joined by Atlantic Fellow for Social and Economic Equity, Maria Carrasco, for a discussion. Maria is joining us from Chile today. Kate Rayworth is an economist focused on making economics fit for the 21st century. Her book, Donut Economics, is an international bestseller that has been translated into 20 languages. Kate is the co-founder of Donut Economics Action Lab, working with cities, businesses, communities, governments, and educators to turn donut economics from a radical idea into transformative action. Maria Carrasco is a social entrepreneur, a civil society professional, and an Atlantic Fellow for Social and Economic Equity. She is one of the co-founders of Entramada, a cooperative group based in Santiago, Chile, which aims to strengthen local communities via work framed as the good living concept. Please note that today we have a live captioner and BSL interpreters. To activate the captions, please click the CC button at the bottom of your screens. If you wish to make use of the BSL interpreting, please pin the two interpreters to your screen. To do this, hover over each of their videos and click the three dots and select pin. This event will run for around one hour and 30 minutes. As usual, there will be an opportunity for you to pose questions to the speakers in the last 25 to 30 minutes of the event. Please do so by utilizing the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens. Kindly state your name and affiliation where possible. This event is being recorded and hopefully will be made available as a podcast subject to no technical difficulties. Now, without further ado, I hand over to Kate. Thank you so much, I mean, it's a real pleasure to be here, especially because I've been working with you at the International Equalities Institute with the Atlantic Fellows for some years. So it's a really lovely way to come back to the LSE. And I'm delighted to be joined by Mary and others here tonight as well. I'm really looking forward to the conversation that we create. So I am going to start by sharing my screen because I like pictures and I believe they help us remake our worldviews. Um, I'm also, with irony, I'm actually sitting in the LSE because I had to be in London today for another event. I live outside the city and uh, so I'm here and I'm delighted that I'm surrounded by empty bookshelves. This is intentional because I believe that the textbooks for economics that we need and deserve in the 20th, 21st century have not yet been written. They're blank, they're waiting to be filled. And I invite today's students to have the ambition and the conviction to fill them with the ideas and the concepts and policies that actually serve us and serve you going forward in this future. So I hope the ideas of donut economics will provide part of that. And of course, donut economics is built on many, many other people's ideas, as I hope to show tonight. So I'm going to talk about donut economics, the concepts, and then particularly, what does it mean when it's put into practice in cities? And I co-founded Donut Economics Action Lab. That name is very intentional. It's all about action. This is all about putting ideas into practice. And we're a lab because we are experimenting and learning as we go. We don't yet know how this is going to work or if it's going to work, but we are trying and learning and it's a thrill. So 
I'm going to start with the concepts. I'm going to start with what I think is wrong and has been wrong and is still really problematic about the way economics is taught in the vast majority of schools and universities. And I'm going to call this 20th century economics. So the first image that's taught, I'm still going to bet my hat. It is supply and demand. I ask the students I teach in Oxford, it's still supply and demand. What does that do? We say, welcome to economics, the art of household management. And we put at the center of our vision, the market. Immediately it centers the market. That's a political choice. It's not an obvious thing to do, it's a choice. And it centers price as the metric of concern. And it means that anything that falls outside the price mechanism is called an externality. I've already racked up three problems. The selfie of humanity, the portrait that we see of ourselves is rational economic man. The way he is depicted, his characteristics, he'd have to look like this. He'd be a man standing alone. He's got money in his hand, ego in his heart, a calculator in his head and nature at his feet. And the more that we tell ourselves that he is like us, we actually become more like him. So. We need a far richer portrait of humanity if we're going to have even half a chance of thriving together, 10 billion people on this planet. And then the goal. The goal of the economy, and I've been looking at the macroeconomics courses in Oxford University, and I'm, I'm hearing from students at the London School of Economics, and I bet it's true the world over. The goal is still pretty much unquestioned, and it's still growth. The idea that countries succeed by growing endlessly, no matter how rich they already are, their solution to their problems lies in yet more growth. This, I think, has is way out of date and has led us into the crises that we now face. In fact, there are new words, polycrisis, permacrisis, to describe the context we have. The 21st century has begun with financial breakdown, with climate breakdown with a crackdown on protesters defending the living world and with COVID lockdown. And these are reported differently in the news, but they all arise from systems based upon endless expansion. And they hit people with vast inequalities of gender and race, of wealth and power between the global north and global south. I believe they all emerge from the idea that success is based in expansion, these systems expand and collapse upon themselves in the process. We need a new vision of what progress and success looks like. And that's where the donut comes in as one possible way. So the goal is to leave no one in the hole, falling short on the essentials of life, leave nobody without those critical resources that the world's governments in the sustainable development goals have already agreed every person has a claim to food, health, education, housing, income, voice. Leave no one falling short. But, and it's a very big but, as we aim to meet the needs of all people, do not overshoot the life supporting systems of our planetary home. The nine planetary boundaries recognized by Earth system scientists in 2009 as the life supporting systems that make life work on this unique and delicately balanced living planet. So the goal is to leave no one falling short, don't overshoot the limits, meet the needs of all people within the means of the living planet. And the shape of progress has already changed. It's not an ever rising line, it's thriving in balance. And it looks just like a heartbeat. Can we take what we understand about health at the human body to the planetary body? Because that is our greatest metaphorical chance of recovering wisdom of what thriving means. And talk about recovering wisdom. When I first drew this diagram and I was struck by how much traction it got in the world 10 years ago, it made me look to the images made by many indigenous cultures of their vision of wealth, of health, of thriving. And they embody 
a sense of dynamism within a circle. So there's something here that has long been known by many indigenous cultures around the world, which is like, a, a, I think of this as a Western mindset recovery program. Can we recover from the mindset of endless growth and, and move towards and learn from this wisdom that's already embodied in other cultures, but we need to find our own way and own expression. I hope the donut is part of that journey. If thriving is the goal, well, we are way from that. We are way out of balance as all of the red in this picture shows, billions of people falling short, massively overshooting planetary boundaries. If graphs don't do it for you, let me give you headlines. The headlines of the newspapers tell us this every day. And of course, there's a real danger we become inured to it. Another country is underwater. Another hurricane has wiped out people's homes. There's another fire burning on some hills somewhere. We can't keep up with it. And there's a danger we zone out to ecological crisis and ecological breakdown. These crises of the living world, I always think that... Uh, if uh, there's a wonderful uh, quote from an American writer, he says, if, if an alien came from outer space and took one look at this planet, they would say, I want to see the manager. And who would we take them to see? And let's add in here the social critical crises. We know that there are water and energy and food shortages connected now. And that the 1% of people in the world own half the world's wealth. I'm going to say that again, even the richest 1% of people in the world own half the world's wealth. Who, who is managing this planet in such an extraordinarily egregious way? This is a world of extreme social inequity and profound ecological breakdown. And to me, this is the story of the 21st century. This is the story to turn around. Last century's economic theories will not get us there. And that's why the book, the shelves are empty. We need to start again with theories and policies and business models and lifestyles that are actually designed to solve this because nothing else will. Now I'm showing you here a global picture. Let's take it down to a national level for very different countries. Malawi, massive human shortfall, not overshooting their share of pressure on the planet. China has the double whammy, human shortfall and ecological overshoot. At the end, we've got the United States, massive overshoot and high inequality. And I've put Denmark here. I could also have put Norway or Sweden, countries that people always think, oh, well, they've got it sorted, haven't they? No, they haven't. They have massive ecological overshoot on a consumption basis. They are overshooting their pressure on the planet. And if, if nothing else does, I beg that this image catches any one of us whenever we talk about developed countries, because there's not a single country I can think of that has the right to give itself that name. There is nothing developed about overshooting planetary boundaries. Let's put those countries in a bigger picture. The sweet spot is that top left-hand corner where we meet the needs of all people and we do so within the means of the living planet. Now, first, you can see that there's not one country there. The closest is Costa Rica. But every country is on a journey of transformation. How can Uganda and Kenya and Malawi meet people's needs for the first time without doing what every country before them has done, overshooting? How can middle-income countries both meet people's needs and already come back within planetary boundaries? And how can those big kickers up there, we've got Sweden, Norway, United States, Canada, Australia, look at that journey. I mean, that's never been done, coming back within those planetary boundaries, how? Every country here needs an unprecedented level of humility and ambition. There ain't a developed one amongst them. We are all transforming. Now you can either take that as utterly overwhelming or you can say this is the most thrilling moment to be alive because everything matters. And the ideas I bring and the policies I recommend and the businesses I design and the action that I lead and participate in all tells, do we keep doing this old path or do we transform? Let's recognize that these countries' stories are interconnected through histories of colonialism, 
through military power, corporate power, trade and finance rules, through resource extraction and climate impacts, predominantly from the global north to the global south. So we need to transform not only within, but between countries. So where on earth do we begin? And this is what excites me. This is what brought me back towards economics. What kind of economic mindset will give us half the chance of turning this story around? What ideas do we want to see on these shelves? I have 14 year old kids at school. If they choose to study economics for A-level in two years time, what do I want them to find when they open the textbook? What are today's undergraduates arriving in universities this time? in the LSE, in Oxford, in Cambridge, in MIT, in Harvard, in Stanford, in China, in India, across the world. What are they being taught? I don't believe that they are being taught the ideas that will turn this story around. And that's a travesty and they deserve more. So some ideas for where we could begin. I would begin never with supply and demand. I would begin with this picture. I call it the embedded economy diagram and it owes itself to many contributors. So we have here the economy, it's embedded in society because it is a social construct, we invented it and we can reinvent it. And society is embedded in the rest of the living world. We are part of nature and dependent upon it. And that economy within the living world, well, that's due to many thinkers. I'm showing here three, Herman Daly, Janine Benyus, Robin Wall Kimmerer, and today I'm going to just lean in and talk about Herman Daly. I have to, because he died two weeks ago today. And he brought the most transformative ideas in economics that have yet to become mainstream. And I cannot think of a single justification why they are not. So Herman Daly, let me lean into him. Here's what Herman Daly saw was wrong with economics when he was a, a senior economist at the World Bank. So supply and demand starts like this. And if you want to talk about the death of the living world, if you want to talk about climate breakdown, it shows up as that shaded wedge. I swear, if, if an alien species wanted to destroy life on Earth and humanity, they would say, oh, get them to talk about the death of the planet on which they depend as an environmental externality. That will take care of it. How can we possibly think that that is an adequate way of talking about our planetary home and the living systems of which we're a part and which we depend? How can we have macroeconomic models, such as the circular flow diagram and all macro models that have drawn out of them, that do not show that they are utterly embedded and dependent upon drawing on and putting out waste into the living world? This is what motivated Herman Daly back in the 1970s when I was a toddler. He was on it already. And Herman Daly drew this diagram, which massively changed my worldview. He said, well, the economy has to be drawn within a circle that we recognize as the ecosystem, call it the biosphere, call it the living world, call it earth. We recognize the economy is an open subsystem of a closed system. And maybe once, maybe Adam Smith and to, you know, John Stuart Mill and maybe even John Maynard Keynes, maybe they could imagine they lived in empty world when there was just enough nature to absorb our waste and to provide for our wants. But we don't. We live in full world. And he drew the economy touching the edges of the circle. That changed my worldview in a flash. And of course, it's when the planetary boundary scientists come along and say, well, we're not touching the edge of the circle. We are massively overshooting that circle. And that's what these planetary boundary overshoots that are now in the donut are showing. So huge thanks to Herman Daly. Huge thanks to Herman Daly. And why? Let me stop here and say, why is this not the starting point for every single economic macroeconomic model? I challenge every economics professor to justify why it is adequate not to embed the human economy within the living world because we're utterly dependent upon it. Drawing that circle around it changes everything and that's why it's challenging, that's why it's threatening, that's why it's work, but it has to be done. You could probably hear, I'm, I'm quite like wound up about this and I feel it more strongly now that Herman Daly has died. How can this obvious vision be ignored 
and and, and it must it, it just must be an imperative from now on. So I want to throw down that challenge. How can we not do this? And I invite every student to challenge every macroeconomics professor. Where is the living world? Why is this economy you're teaching me not embedded in it? Don't tell me it's an externality. It's the life on which we depend. So we can go also inside this diagram I shared. And, and now we can start to see the economic actors. Yes, there's the market. And, we, and, and think about our identities. We may turn up as a consumer, producer, capital or labor or be destitute and excluded from the market. And of course, Karl Marx reminded us, we must always ask in the space of production, are you capital or labor? It really matters whether you're getting wages or rents. And then we can look at the state, right? There's the market and the state. Public servant, are you a resident, a voter, a protester, or are you stateless? And I think two people who've done a lot of really valuable work in recent decades, Harjun Chang, Mariana Mazzucato, to call on us to rethink the relationship and the stories told about that balance between market and state. But that still can end up being uh, an ideological boxing match. Are you free market laissez-faire capitalist or are you state-loving socialist? It's a, that's what shows up in GDP and it's ignoring the whole other raft of sources of our well-being in the economy. The care economy of unpaid caring work parent, partner, relative, child, or are you kinless? And this work by Nancy Fulbray, by Diane Elson, by Peggy Antrobus, by Marilyn Waring, by many feminist economists called on us to never ignore this. How can this be missing from mainstream economics? Because the unpaid reproductive economy is foundational to enabling the paid so-called productive economy. And then let's bring in the commons where people gather and they could create value not through markets or the state, but through collaboration as a co-creator, sharer, repairer, a steward. And of course, this is the work of Elena Ostrom, who showed us the commons don't have to be just a tragedy of the commons, which is what most students encounter. They can be a triumph when people organize. And then let's look at finance. Are you a creditor, a debtor, an investor, a trader, or financially excluded? Two people whose work I find really valuable for rewriting the story. Stephanie Kelton on modern monetary theory and Bernard Lietar, who wrote about the deep design of money and its role and relation in the world. So I wanted to share here some people who've massively influenced my own thinking in these spaces. But let's take those away and ask ourselves also what happens when we look at economic identities and relations in context of power and crisis? How do these roles change? Well, suddenly in the market space, of course, we get the market capturer the rent seeker in the space of the public, the state, the corrupt or the oppressor. In finance, the speculator, the hoarder. In the household, the patriarch, the exploiter. And in the commons, the encloser and the extractor. And I've said here, oh, economics in the, ident in, in the context of power and crisis. And of course, it's always in the context of power and maybe going forward, the context of crisis is the norm. And so I think it's essential to bring these power relations and the realities of what happens in these different forms of organizing and ask ourselves, how can we design for a future where we avoid the market always flipping to rent seeking market capture? How can we create commons that are defended against enclosure and extraction? These, I think, are questions that should be filling the bookshelves behind me. So how can we get into the donut? How can we turn this story around? I believe we need to put two dynamics at the center of our vision to become regenerative and distributive by design. We've inherited linear degenerative economies. We take, make, use and lose. And we need to turn them into regenerative cyclical economies where we use, recycle, repair, and we live and work within the cycles of the living world. What could that look like? At the landscape scale, it could look something like this. Feel it. Feel that difference between the degeneration and the regeneration. In industry, it can look like something like this, not waste dumped in the neighborhoods of the world's poorest people, but repairing and repurposing and reusing and refurbishing and renewing bring it down to a city and it's about replacing 10 lane highways with a nature park as here in Seoul. That's not Photoshop, that's real.
And then at the level of a building, would you rather get well in this UK hospital with not a single living thing in sight or in this Singaporean hospital? We know that people heal better when they're surrounded by nature. How do we bring nature back to the spaces in which we live and get well? At the same time as becoming regenerative, we must recognize we've inherited economic systems that tend to be divisive by design. They capture opportunity and value in the hands of a few. Through power, through privilege, through networks, through law, the law of capital, the code of capital, as Katerina Pistol would call it. How do we create distributive economies that share value and opportunity with everyone who co-creates it? What could that look like in the space of housing? London, I'm sitting right now, we know has a rent and housing crisis. Housing has become a speculator's asset. Sorry, sorry affair that people actually needed as a human right to live in as well. City of Vienna recognized housing as a human right decades ago, century ago. And so 60% of people live in socially owned housing by the city or by city co-ops because that's what housing is for, meeting people's rights. Why have we inherited profit-driven business when we can have purpose-led business if we redesign? It doesn't have to be that way. Business itself can share value as this craft industry in Mumbai, share value with all who create the products. So when they come together, of course, and here in now I'm going to move to talking about cities, when it comes together, can we create spaces that are both regenerative and distributive? equitable, accessible, and re renewing the living world and reducing our footprint on the planet. So I'm going to take the story down to what happens when these ideas actually get applied. And one of the ways that Donut Economics Action Lab we work is we, we've never pushed the ideas on anybody. We've never tried to persuade anyone to use anything. It's those who come and get in touch and say, these ideas look useful to us where we are. And cities, and towns and neighborhoods and places have been the pioneers of this. So here's the tool we invite them to use. How can our city help bring humanity into the donut? Well, let's unroll that donut to make some space we can go inside and use it as a canvas for reimagining our future. And we ask this question, how can our city be a home to thriving people in a thriving place while respecting the well-being of all people and the health of the whole planet? Big question, I know. We can divide it into four lenses. We've got the local, about this place that we experience here, and then recognizing our global responsibilities because every place is profoundly connected with people and planet worldwide. So we can start by asking, how can all the people of this place thrive? What would it mean to thrive here? What would it mean in London where I am? What would it mean in Lusaka? or Dar es Salaam, or Stockholm, or Mumbai, or Dubai. Different cultures, values, histories, people will come up with their own answer and meaning of what that looks like. What would it mean for our city to be as generous as the wildland next door? Because nature thrives differently in Stockholm and Dubai and Mumbai and London and Lusaka. Nature has a genius everywhere of figuring out how to sequester carbon, how to store groundwater after a storm, how to cool the air in the forest, how to house biodiversity. How can we learn from nature's generosity where we are and bring that into the design of a city so it is as cooling as the forest? It sequesters carbon like the forest. It houses wildlife. It makes us belong and our settlements belong in the living world of which we're a part. So these are the two local aspirations of the four lenses. And now let's go to the global responsibilities. How can our city respect the health of the whole planet? And this is where we come to those overshooting planetary boundaries. This is the global consumption footprint, the global carbon emissions that worldwide have an impact. All the food and clothes and electronics, and, con and construction materials and consumer goods that we import and that stream of waste we export, how can that come back within planetary boundaries? And lastly, still thinking of those global supply chains, how can we respect the well-being of people worldwide who stitched our clothes and picked and packed our food? 
Who's impacted today by the climate reality that our city has helped to cause? And how do we welcome migrants with official policy and a culture of welcome? How do we impact on people of other places? How do universities express solidarity internationally, inviting international students to create that empathy, understanding and connection that we know the world depends upon? So those are the four lenses. And we began experimenting these with cities in 2019, before COVID. What we learned, and these are city policymakers and community members, the first thing they said is it is such a relief to be using a framework that's holistic, that we're sitting together and all of the issues are on the table and we can look at the interconnection between them. We're fed up of having a climate plan and a transport plan and a equity plan and a water plan. We need to bring them together. Let me tell you about some of the places, and these are the local governments and city councils around the world that are currently have contacted us and said, we are using this framework in our own way to bring about transformation here. And one of the places you can see in Chile, El Monte, and Mary is going to speak to that today. I'm so delighted. So I'll just mention a couple of places. Amsterdam was the first in the height of the COVID crisis. Amsterdam published its city portrait with its ambition of becoming a circular city. And they created a Dutch orange donut, a vision of being a thriving, inclusive, regenerative city for all residents while respecting planetary boundaries. What if every city adopted that vision and then actually followed it? That would transform everything. They put the donut literally at the top of their circular strategy and then started experimenting and introducing circularity in construction, in textiles, in food. At the same time, many civic organizations in Amsterdam spontaneously decided to create the Amsterdam Donut Coalition to recognize that the many, many activities already going on help in many different ways to bring humanity into the donut. They started celebrating donut pioneers. They have every year now the Amsterdam Donut Days. And, and of course, there's one level, I think, what is going on? We're talking about donuts everywhere. But there's something playful about it. Many people are afraid of economics. No one is afraid of donuts. It's an invitation to get involved. In the city of Leeds, they've taken the concept. They've created their own local donut. They unrolled it and they're using it as part of the vision of transforming Leeds to become a safe, inclusive, just, low carbon city by 2030. In the city of Birmingham, a phenomenal work led by a community organization called Civic Square, taking these concepts down to the neighborhood, down to the level of a few streets. What does it mean for us to do this here? And they're using it as part of a, a plan of retrofitting the streets. So this is deeply practical, bringing concepts to local transformation. If anyone's interested in local stuff, I so recommend you check out the work of Civic Square. They are phenomenal. And go visit them. They're a city away. The government of Bhutan got in touch. They said, we see a lot of connections between our model of gross national happiness and this donut. And so we've started working with them and their regional planning in Timpu and Paro, the major cities in the country. City of Barcelona have taken on the concept. They are creating a portrait, gathering targets and indicators, engaging both the city statisticians, but also the community, making it a conversation. What kind of city do we want to become? So let me pull out from these examples and say, that in all of these places, what we've found is that no matter the ambition, they come back and say, we need to transform our institutions if we're going to transform the outcomes. And many of the city councillors and mayors said, you know, we inherited from the last century a mindset that says we succeed by growing endlessly. And that's part of what's holding us back. What else is holding us back in the old ways? What's stopping us? from transforming? And what is already actually propelling us forward? What have we already got in place? What's already in action that's taking us in the direction we want to go? And I'm going to offer you five design traits of organizations that I use now to look at every kind of organization, whether it's a city council, 
or a university or a company or an NGO. And these come from their brilliant theorist and analyst, Marjorie Kelly. So I'm going to talk you through at the scale of a city, purpose, networks, governance, ownership, and finance. Let's start with purpose. What is the vision of this city? What's the government's vision of the place, its identity, its pride? You can co-create that vision of the city, create new metrics, and set ambitious goals. But that has to be backed up by the relationships that the, the government holds. Who does it in conversation with? Who's missing from those conversations? How do you amplify the voices of those who are not always heard? How do you connect with other cities and learn from your peers? How do you bring innovative change makers together and give them space to bring about those innovations in the city? Moving to governance. How can cities, for example, learn through experiment, pilot and scale up what works? This is obviously from things like universal basic income to cycle lanes. This is how cities get started. Promoting citizens assemblies. Often cities do this saying, I know the policies that need to be put in place, but it's very difficult for me to believe I will be reelected if I bring them about. The citizens don't have that fear of the election cycle. They will come up with things more ambitious than we do, bring their voice in. And then, as I said at the beginning, breaking out of silos, bringing people together around a shared framework. Let's go deeper. The deeper we go, the more profound it gets. The ownership of the city. How can the city make the most of public uh, assets like public transport, public energy, public water? How can community owned assets, community land trusts, for example, be supported and enabled by cities? This is a really interesting question. Many cities are now facing. How can we enable more community ownership and land trusts? And how can we use public land to accelerate that change? Who owns the key assets of this city? And are they owned in a distributive way and that will bring about regenerative design? And then going deepest, finance. How is finance shaping this city? Can we use approaches like participatory budgeting? Can we ensure we divest city pensions from the very things that are destroying our futures? Can we use community wealth building to create anchor institutions in city institutions and purchase locally and rebuild a, a dense local network of enterprise? So those are the five design traits. And then of course we recognize that every city is based in a nation, often within a region in the world. It doesn't have all the power. City policymakers actually can say, we're quite constrained in what we can do compared to national legislation. So we start by saying, what's holding you back? And we can come up with all sorts of different examples and reasons, local to global, that are holding the city back. But what's already moving you forward? Again, multiple reasons to celebrate and to lean into. And we've done this workshop with cities from Amsterdam to Ipoh in Malaysia, Toronto, Barcelona. These are policymakers and community members taking stock, like a power analysis. What can we stop, let go of and leave behind? You can see that written on the wall in Amsterdam. What can we start, spread and amplify? What can we do here because it's within our power? And what can we only do? when we combine with others. So let me pull back and, and just reflect because this work has only begun recently. It was stopped by COVID and it's restarting. And at Donut Economics Action Lab, we're watching what's happening. Like I said, we never push. We don't try and make it happen somewhere. It's happening where policymakers are saying these ideas work for us. And that's when we get involved. So they tell us the reason why we're engaging with this is because it's a really clear visual communication. People get it. It combines the social and the ecological. Crucial. It's a holistic way to measure progress. And we get to set our own metrics. It's not imposed. It's not internationally comparable like the SDGs. There's value to that. There's also a downside to that, that somebody else decided how to measure well-being in your place. This tool. You create your own metrics. And 
it's a tool and an entry point into a progressive and transformative agenda. How do we become a regenerative city? How do we become a distributive city? How do we end the dependency on endless growth? Cities and regions are getting started in many, many different ways. I won't read all of these through, but we, again, ask ourselves, what's the first thing they're doing? Some use it as a dashboard. Some use it as a thinking tool. Some create a city portrait to open up a dialogue. Some build a vision around it. Some start to demonstrate a project. Every entry point is a valid entry point. And we believe that the councillors and the mayors are the best placed people seeing their entire political context to decide what's the smart way to get started. So it looks different in every place. But we recognize also there's this tension between it's a long journey and yet it's urgent. And there are many uncertainties and complexities along the way. So it's not going to be a smooth path, which means it's hard to hold places to account. How do you hold Amsterdam or Copenhagen or Brussels or Mexico City to account once they've said we're aiming for the donut? What is a reasonable rate of progress? What are the setbacks that get faced? These are all questions we are asking ourselves as we build this work. That's why it's an action lab. So let me pull right back and finish. I began with these concepts of the 20th century. They don't deserve the minds of today's students. They do not serve. In fact, they disserve because images go into our visual cortex. They sit there for decades. We might not realize they're there anymore, but they are there and they shape what we see and what we don't see. They shape what we put at the center of our vision and what we leave peripheral. And therefore they powerfully shape our worldview, what we believe matters and what we ignore. We need to move past these ideas. And I offer these from Donut Economics, along with many others, part of an ecosystem of ideas. But I also believe we're just getting started. So I hope the donut will soon be outdated because somebody else will have reinvented it even better. I hope that these ideas will be enriched by the students who are part of this conversation today, by the academics who are part of this conversation today. How do we fill those shelves with the ideas that we all know this century urgently needs? I often say that 21st century economics is going to be practiced first and theorized later because there's a lot of practice going on. And maybe then the textbooks will catch up. But we can't wait. We need for today's students to be given a transformative mindset to give them half a chance of creating the future that they come to university wanting to learn. And I'm going to end with, I met a student today at a completely different place. She has just completed a master's in public administration here at the LSE. She said to me, I didn't learn about climate change over two years. The syllabus is not what we're wanting. Now, I'm not meaning to critique specifically the LSE. I just happened to meet her. I talk to students in Oxford University. And when I teach some of these ideas, they all come to me and say, why isn't this taught to every undergraduate PPE student? Because it's not. And I'm throwing down the gauntlet to, to our universities. How can we not? How can we not be giving the students the basis that we know makes sense on this planet? Life on earth, life is dependent upon life. Economics, must be re-embedded in the living world. So I shall end there by saying, we invite all of you to engage with the tools and concepts of Donut Economics Action Lab. Anybody is welcome to become a member or just to browse and look at our tools. And if you're interested in the downscaling I just described around cities, we call these Donut Unrolled and you can explore making that a tool for your place. If students want to pick it up and use it as part of a master's dissertation and several have, go ahead and go for it. And I really look forward to this becoming a conversation. Thank you very much. Wow. Thank you so much, Kate. That, that was a real tour de force and um, so many ideas that you've shared with us. I, and I can already see so many questions popping up. But before we turn to the questions, I would like to invite Maria. Mari, um, I hand over the virtual microphone to you. Yeah, I just can start the video. So if the 
if you allow me to share and start my screen. Okay. There we go. Now I'm here. Thank you, Armin. Um, so I will start uh, saying good evening all. I'm very delighted it, and it's a pleasure to be commenting on Kate Rower's work about rethinking the process of how do we create well and how do we thrive as a humanity while taking care of our environment. And how did I get here? Uh, because I was just listening this kind, the same kind of um, presentation. Um, and there, were, there was a mix and a very coherent uh, methodology that was placed by the donut economic uh, thinking that includes environmental aspects that are a key uh, and, and a central aspect of a non-anthropocentric view about well-being and, and what is the so-called development. So with Entramada, which is the cooperative group, we adapted the methodology with the Global South perspective. So in order to do that, we engage, we, we produce, uh, we organize a seminar, we produce a video raising this new concept about the donut economic. Uh, we involved, we got involved with uh, local leaders and we integrate the participation actively, the participation of the community as a core value. And we integrated also new questions. So how does the rest of the world respect the boundaries of El Monte in this case? So um, we run uh, a process for over three months. We integrated more than 50, uh, 50 people representative of the, of the community. And um, in conclusion, we uh, the methodology allow to build in adaptation and resilience to address climate uh, climate uh, change and ecological traits, and as identify areas of priority when developing local plants. Um, however, and and as um, Kate mentioned, there are five traits that she mentioned, and I want to bring three concepts. They are very different or might place a very different concept uh, from the Global South uh, perspective. And those concepts are narratives, trust, and uh, regulations. So the first concept, concept, and I'm very glad that Kate um, talked a little bit about it. You know, Timpu, I mean, I was working for the Gross National Happiness Commission in Bhutan over, uh, over a period of time. And you can see how different is the is the narrative around well-being? Around uh, well-being is about also about you know being generous and the, this non-materialistic view. So when we talked about uh, the donut economic, we have to be very conscious that we are talking about a counter-hegemonic narrative. So for for the global south, especially after a post-COVID scenario. Uh, there seems to be raising again this uh, solution that economic growth is the only way how we can overcome our, our all you know social problems, uh, the rising insecurity, poverty, unemployment issues, and so on. So, in this sense, uh, the potential of the donut economic and the great in city portrait uh, methodology, in special, um, it's about creating a concept of well-being and thriving from a daily basis consensus. It's not about ideologies and co very complex concepts um, because they lost importance in, in a daily basis life uh, in some sense, but it's about how these uh, questions that uh, Kate was um, highlighting bring us to you know, the daily basis life. And from there is much, it's much more easy to get connected with neighbors um, and with the local planning. And in that sense as well, uh, it, brings, uh, it brings more connection uh, to see uh, hope in solutions that are possible because when we think, you know, in these huge problems uh, as a climate change, eco ecological traits, and, and so on, 
uh, we cannot see uh, how we can um, produce a, a solution that could be um, that could be, you know, like affordable. So, in that sense, it's very important to amplify uh, the successful solutions as well. And in that uh, in that order, you start to building up this new narrative about what it's supposed to be uh, development, trust. You know, like um, and trusts is related with uh, the network and the ownership, as a trade that Kate was mentioning. But in the global north, um, the the level of trust is higher than in the global south. So we are we face low legitimacy of our institution, high level of corruption, uh, the the high level of inequality undermine trust as well. So how do we? start to or face network and ownership uh, to with that context because in the global uh, north it's easier to start a cooperative for example but in the global south you need to build trust first in order to do that so the potential again of the methodology is that if you bring into the community as part of this process of ambition a long-term impact that puts humanity in the center as a social foundation and the earth as, a, as, as the house, you know, with the planetary boundaries, can promote uh, collaboration cross-sector and multi-stakeholder. So if you have, if you don't have an, a network and you and you have a network that, that might not have a high level of trust and, and confidence among their members, you can have a specific and measurable objective that can uh, can bring people together and start to work together. Um, and that, again, might create the sense, this sense of belonging because ownership and, you know, who owns well, who owns the company, of course, is important. But when you are in context where those, where, where the inequality is so high, it's very difficult to address sometimes that, you know, the 1% that, of the territory that owns the 99% of the wealth. But if you think about belonging, the, the sense of belonging to the community, to their territory, the potential of the methodology is that you embrace one vision and you start to share values and you focus on wealth as connecting people with their territory. And from there, start to build up uh, local industries as well. The, Third concept that I want to bring on is regulation that is related to city governance and finance uh, trade. So um, the city of Amsterdam or the city council of the uh, London city, it has a lot of power compared with the local governments in the global south. The methodology itself reflects uh, the various aspects uh, that are not in control of the municipality here. Uh, the, the public, the local governments has a very low budget and uh, the regulation is even, uh, it's very weak, uh, the, the, the control that they can have over the regulation of the city itself. However, again, the potential of the methodology, it's about identify a window opportunity and the innovation might take place without a leg legislation or more resources. I will, I will take, I will talk later in the next slide about the freshwater withdrawals that actually the methodology highlighted as a huge gap that it needs to be covered. But if you place it, you might get innovations that are not necessarily related with um bringing more money or investing more. It's about use, how do you use the, the fresh water? and uh, uh, building up a strategic alliance, alliances and common vision to sustain this long-term uh, vision and the integration and participation of different actors actually uh, bring the sustainability of this kind of process. So in the case of El Monte, for example, we, um, uh, we conclude that they were overshooting three planetary boundaries, climate change, uh, land compression, and um, fresh water withdrawals. Um, and once that we cross 
uh, we crossed the variables of the municipality and the community, we realized that there were three objectives that the community wanted to address that were not addressed by the municipality. And one of those was uh, ecosystem as a source of uh, a meaningful life, of a joy. So usually uh, from the environmental perspective, the local planning has uh, environment, look at that, you know, environment functions and, 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 and all that. However, the community raised this uh, aspect about environment uh, that Kate also was talking, you know, in the hospital. Trees, uh, rivers, plants actually brings joy and bring this sense of connection. So if you, if you look like that from the local planning, you might get actually a, a bigger view and a long-term view, but based on the well-being of you know, people's well-being, not just about growth. And the fresh water withdrawals uh, was not important for the community, neither for the municipality. And this is very straightforward, a very coherent picture about in the, in the case of Chile, as uh, Chile, it's one of the country with the most privatized scheme uh, of uh, fresh water. And it's one of, I think it's the second uh, uh, most, uh, the, it's the second country that consume most uh, fresh water per capita in the world. So it's not important for people, neither for, for the municipality itself. So, you know, the methodology is showing something that is actually very important for the, uh, for the planetary boundaries and for our own uh, living in this territory, in this planet. So the conclusions, in lights of narrative, envision the purpose uh, based on a daily life. The methodology allows with very simple uh, con uh, questions to bring complex concepts into a community or a daily basis conversation in the light of trust uh, and low trust uh, from the global south. Develop planning, um, develop planning with cross uh, sector actors around a specific and measurable objectives, setting the expectation of the process. And in this sense, every plan is different. Of course, uh, I was in Tim I was living in Timpu. The planning in Timpu will be very different from the planning of El Monte. Um, but that is the richness of the methodology as well and integrate into the uh, to the community into the process to increase the sustainability and regulations in light of regulation consider the power and the vision that might trigger actually attracting funding and other type of capital social capital for example to solve common problems and this is what uh, Kate was saying about you know this tension and this uncertainty and complexity that you might face along the process but as um, uh, Bandana Shiva says and I, I finish with this I do not allow myself to overcome by hopelessness, no matter how tough is the situation. I believe that if you just do your little bit without thinking of the biggest of what you stand against, if you turn to the enlargement of your own capacities, just that itself creates a new potential. And that is what this methodology uh, brings to the city. Thank you. Excellent, Mari. Thank you so much for your presentation and sharing your experience and your thoughts with us. Um, it's been great listening to you alongside Kate and to see how you're um, trying to put this into action and your experiences. Um, there are a lot of questions and more are popping up. So I'm now going to turn to questions. Kate, if you could turn on your camera or Kate's camera could be turned on. Thank you. So um, I will combine some of the questions because there's quite a few people asking a question about how do you make this happen given the powerful interests of governments, of elites, of multinational corporations that stand to lose by what some of you are um, proposing. So Kate, if you could take that as the first question about 
how do you make this happen through political processes, changing mindsets? So. Well, we just start. We just start. Uh, and, and of course, what's, where, where people are getting started using these tools of donut economics, they're not starting in a vacuum. They're starting surrounded by Fridays for Future or Extinction Rebellion or centuries and decades of social movements, right? So there's a rich web of movements. And if I think in the climate space, uh, a lot of the movements quite rightly are protest, right? So Extinction Rebellion focuses on well, it actually says love and rage, right? There's a beautiful combination of the anger and the celebration, but it's about stopping climate breakdown. We also have to, along with what we're saying, what we're against and we're stopping, we have to articulate what we're for. So this sits with many, many other social actors. At Deal, we always say, don't try to be the movement, join the movement. And we see ourselves as part of a bigger movement. So there's no, so I suppose what I'm saying is it's not a moment of starting because you, you're, 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 you're playing into a space. Now, um, one of our principles at Deal, again, and I've mentioned this a couple of times, we've never tried to persuade anybody. We would never have said to Mary, you know, oh, please try and do this in El Monte. I mean, that's crazy. Only herself and her colleagues and allies can judge whether in El Monte this looks like a useful tool in our context here and now. Uh, I'll tell you, I'm going to tell a funny story actually as to why I have this policy of uh, never knock on a shut door, go where the energy is. And I'm going to tell, and I'm, I'm, I'm playing with the LSE. It's because when my book was first coming out, my publisher said to me, when your book is launched, I can get you a seminar at the LSE to launch the book. And he sent the draft of my, my book to the LSE and then came back very embarrassed and sent this email to me. They come back saying, thank you very much, Penguin Random House, for this manuscript. We have passed it around some colleagues. However, there is no interest in this at this time. This is in 2016-17. So there was no webinar. There's no seminar at the LSE, no launch. So that was a bit of a slap in the face. And that made me think, right. That is the last time I ever knock on a shut door and I give the establishment the, the pleasure of saying, thank you, but no, thank you. We don't want this. Now, of course, the lovely thing that did happen is the students wanted it and the Rethinking Economic students invited me to the LSE and it was on sale in the bookshop and it was in the window. And, and of course, over the year, and then Armina, you and others at the International and the Qualities Institute. And now I actually, every year, I'm in one capacity or another presenting at the LSE and many students say, we read your book. So I'm telling that story. It's a lovely one to bring back to where it began, but it's been a wonderful principle for me. We don't knock on a shut door, go where the energy is. Now, this comes back to how do you take on these vested interests? Some people do need to take these vested interests on full frontal, expose corruption, challenge power, lock on, block bridges, go on strike, right? Take it on. That is one important piece of energy. There's another piece of energy that says, we're going to go where possibility is emerging. And I don't know if it'll carry on. We start in Amsterdam and then Copenhagen and Brussels and El Monte and Ipo and Timpu. Some of these may peter out. They get started, a new government will be elected. It, it doesn't carry on. That's the risk you take. But that's also the opportunity that's popping up. So it, it's too early for me to say this is how to do it because we're only just beginning to gain traction. And of course, the more traction that you gain, the more the vested interests say, oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. This isn't just playing around. This is getting serious. And they will mobilize. So we've yet to really fully experience that. What I will say is I know that in the European Commission, for example, they are there's interests within the commission and there's always good people, progressive, ambitious people in every single institution. Never dismiss a whole institution. Never dismiss a whole company. There are people trying to change it from within. And in, in the European Union, they are watching all these major European cities, Barcelona and Brussels and Copenhagen and Amsterdam. Uh, oh, this innovation is popping up. 
So cities and places can punch above their weight. They can demonstrate to the bigger system that change. Thank you, Kate. Um, I think I think this is really about thinking again the the complexity. It's not just one process, but again, it's it's several things coming together. And I think Mari also really touched upon that in her talk. The next question um, takes us to our mutual colleague Jason Hickel's work, and the question is: Where does the donut model fit in with regards to degrowth versus green growth theories? Okay, so the first thing that I think is essential in any conversation about degrowth is to define it. So if if I had Jason here, let me imagine pulling Jason. Jason, and I asked him this in a webinar, maybe somebody saw recently, I hosted a webinar between Jason Hickel and Sam Fankhauser on degrowth and green growth. And I said, Jason, please, can you define green growth? And Jason said, "Green, sorry, define degrowth. And Jason said, degrowth is a managed process of reducing the resources used in production to come back within planetary boundaries in a just and managed and equitable way. Now, when I listen to that, well, I see the donut. I see overshooting planetary boundaries and coming back within them in a just and equitable way that meets the needs of all people. So I would say that they are extremely closely aligned. I believe the debate about green growth is an empirical one. And of course, ultimately the empirics that matter in the future. So I challenge anybody who is 100% convinced we can have green growth or 100% certain we can't. I can't prove it either way, but let me put my cards on the table very happily as I do in my book. I have not seen any empirical evidence that makes me believe that high income countries are showing they can decarbonize and dematerialize. It's not just about carbon emissions, it's also about our material footprint and our resource use. I've not seen evidence that they are decarbonizing and dematerializing on anything like the scale that is required. Yes, we see a little bit of decoupling, particularly around carbon. We see absolute decoupling, but it's around one to two percent a year. Now, the green growth is cheer and say, this is green growth. That's like telling me you're running for the bus, but actually you're just jogging. The bus is going to have gone. Yeah, OK, you were running for the bus, but you missed the bus. So don't say I'm running for the bus. You missed the bus. One to two percent is a fraction of what's needed. Kevin Anderson, for example, would say it's eight to 10% a year on year on year on year that's needed in high income countries. So we need absolute sufficient decoupling. We need green enough growth. And I've never seen any country show evidence that it's generating green enough growth. Therefore, I do not trust in a growth-based future. And I believe the urgency in our economies is to remove the dependency on endless growth from our economies. I hope that's clear. Absolutely clear. Absolutely clear. Um, I, and I think this is the, this is a debate that we should perhaps host here as, at, at LSE at some point to bring um, these discussions to the students. Um, the next question, because we've talked a lot about what governments, local or national, can or can't do and political elites, but what about financial markets and financial corporations? How do you work with them and incentivize them um, to, to take up this model? So that's one of the questions that was posed to you in the Q&A. Okay. Um, I'm going to stand right back and I say, if, if you saw the signboard, it said purpose, networks, governance, ownership, and finance. Finance is sitting at the bottom in the way that sometimes the most powerful things sit at the bottom. So I think the financial system and the design of finance is existentially essential. So I'm not going to jump in and try and say, here's how to incentivize the finance system. My own thinking is at a stage like further back from that, uh, and I'm going to say this, on this planet, everything degrades and deteriorates. Bodies die, fruit rots, 
metal rusts, um, wood gradually rots, everything deteriorates. It's subject to the second law of thermodynamics. It degrades. Now, of course, the genius of life, it captures the energy coming from the sun and turns that back into life again. That's the genius of life. That's what makes this planet unique. But everything degrades and loses. Now, money, money has been designed on a completely different basis. Finance has been designed with the expectation and the demand of cumulative return. 3% on 3% on 3% on 3%. So it grows endlessly. And there is nothing living on this planet that succeeds by doing that. We think growth is a wonderful, healthy phase of life, and it is. But there's an other end to that metaphor. And if I tell you my friend went to the doctor and the doctor told her she had a growth, we feel completely different about it because we already understand it in our bodies. It's a threat to the health of the whole. So. If we understand that in nature, nothing thrives by growing forever, why would we think it's going to work to have designed a financial system in which finance expects its return to grow forever? So I don't have a quick answer about here's an incentive for finance. I, I, I think it's at another level of transformation, which is, and I would love students to be asking this profound question, what would it mean for finance to be designed, and I mean money to be designed, in service to life? What kind of money would be in service, what kind of finance would be in service to the kinds of enterprises, the kinds of companies that I believe we need that can become regenerative and distributive? Because companies can make regenerative designs. There are brilliant students who are like, I can make regenerative textiles. I can create a circular economy. We can reuse this. We can create a more distributive econ com a company. But where is the finance that will back that? So it's the massive redesign question. And, I, and we don't yet work with finance closely because if we just open our doors to finance, they'll eat us for breakfast because that's what they do. So at Donut Economics Action Lab, we've just opened up our work to business. This week, in fact, we launched our tools for business. And we're now working with innovative companies. Now we'll start saying, how do we invite innovative finance to this conversation? Thank you, Kate. Um, yes, I, I think that that's a really interesting way of thinking about it. And, and you know, it's good that company or at least businesses are, are being included in this discussion. The next question, um, there's a couple of people who've posted on this is what sorts of knowledge have you drawn from indigenous communities? And how has that impacted your work? And what more can we learn from indigenous communities? So we had a couple of people asking about that. Great question. So the slide I showed very early on of the donut, and then I showed it next to the Maori Takarangi, the Taoist uh, endless, uh, the Taoist Yin Yang, the Buddhist endless knot, the medicine wheel of Turtle Island, and I present donut economics as um, almost like a bridge towards a wisdom that is held in those ways of thinking. The Western mindset, which has been so trained and addicted to endless growth and excluding the living world, you can't just adopt, oh, I think we'll take the Maori concept and use it. You can't, that, that would be ultimate cultural appropriation. So I think the Western mindset needs to have its own recovery program, come up with its own way back towards a wisdom that we can see other cultures have, be inspired by it, but find our own way there. So there's a lot of learning from that. And I love the work of people like Robin Wall Kimmerer talking about that interplay of the Western science and her own indigenous knowledge that she had to relearn because she hadn't, you know, had been robbed of her own community. Since I published Donut Economics, I, one of the biggest thrills has actually been in conversation and contacted by different indigenous thinkers and leaders from different kinds of communities, for example, um, Indigenous knowledge leader from Hawaii, uh, from the Sami people, from Maori communities. In fact, two different Maori community thinkers drew their own versions of the donut. One said, I see the donut as Mother Earth and Father Sky. 
And the other said, I'm going to turn the donut inside out and make a Maori and, and, and put the, the ecological on the inside and the social on the outside. So playing with it. And that's a really humbling honor that several people, and they don't represent everybody, but have said, of all the Western mindsets I've seen now, this begins to make some sense. And, and, and finding it is a bridge. And it's like, um, sometimes words really get in the way. And we are very analytical about words, but sometimes images can act more of a bridge, more representational and give us chance to connect. Um, I also think that, that there's no reason why the donut should be used in every community. If, if in Bhutan, they say we see a connection here with gross national happiness, let's let's explore it. But also there may be went many places to say, no, no, we, we have when we have our concepts, we have our vision, we have the Maori thinking and philosophy. We don't need that. We see you doing your thing. We're doing our thing. Absolutely. So it's having a pluriverse. And I hope the donut contributes to that pluriverse of worldviews. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Um, this is a question um, coming <clears throat> from India. It says, how would you respond to the argument that developing countries should not be held accountable at the same level as supposedly developed countries with the backdrop of national politics and policy? Um, can sit, so it's about, you know, the differences in terms of, um, you know, where countries are in terms of their growth. So first of all, I don't think there are any developed countries, but I know what this person is saying. And now we're talking about, let's say, high income countries and middle and lower income countries. Um, uh, it's interesting, the question makes it sound as if I was implying that they were all somehow equally accountable. I mean, what I was saying was every nation needs to transform, but I also pointed out that there are historic power relations and damages caused by one from the other, and, and it's very timely, right? COP right now is debating loss and damage. Many countries talk about reparations and there's fascinating calculations of the costs and the plunder of colonialism that's only just beginning to be accounted for and recognized. So, and actually going back to the founding of the UNFCCC, it recognizes the common but differentiated responsibilities of nations to respond to climate change. And I think, I think that phrase, although it's never been materially made sense of or adequately made sense of, there is a common responsibility. We are all nations, but they are highly differentiated because of histories, because of responsibility, because of historic responsibility of carbon emissions, for example. So I don't see a, um, of, of course, there are different responsibilities and there are different obligations to stop harming others. Maybe, maybe the thing I should lean into here is that when we created the downscale donut, it was very, very important for us creating it to say, this is not just about being thriving people in a thriving place. If it was just that, Denmark and Sweden and Australia would be fabulous, wonderful places to live. And we have, you know, clean harbors. You can swim in the harbor and we've got forests and clean air because that's just our locality. We, it was really important to say, and you are globally connected to and therefore impacting on the life chances and the possibilities and rights of others. So we show your global responsibilities. And that's why the planetary boundaries are consumption based. And that's why we look at the global social relations. And I, I think all frameworks of well-being, there are many different approaches to talking about well-being. It should also say, and how do we pursue our own well-being here while respecting that of others? So to me, the responsibility, again, of those high income countries to transform and respect the well-being of others. But Mary, for example, raised this wonderful question. And in El Monte, they said, not only how are we impacting on the well-being of others, but as a country that may be particularly impacted, for example, by climate breakdown, how is the pursuit of others' well-being impacting on us? And I know allies in Bangladesh have wanted to ask those same questions and built that into the framework. This is a really great example of adapting the framework to make sense locally. Thank you, Kate. Um, another question is slightly different. It's coming from um, someone in Slovenia who asks about how other how you are engaging with other disciplines. So you talked a lot about economists and economics. 
Um, how are other academic disciplines exploring donut principles, such as sociologists or anthropologists? What kinds of conversations are you having um, with colleagues from those disciplines? Great question. Um, so first of all, I would say the of all the academic disciplines that have engaged with donut economics, economics has engaged the least. Mainstream economics departments, it, I mean, there's a very easy strategy. Ignore, just ignore. So again, students tell me, no, no, we weren't recommended to read your book. I mean, we've all read it, but we were, it's not on the reading list. Ignore, maybe it'll go away. So uh, yeah, I have very little contact with mainstream economics departments. Ecological economics, well, I mean, they say, hello, come in. This is home turf, Herman Daly. This is, this is it. Feminist economics, complexity economics, business schools. Yes, business schools really want this because business actually happens in the real world. Business is subject to climate impacts, to labor strikes. So it makes sense. It's material and embodied. Um, urban design, urban planning, politics, geography. They're like, yeah, this is this completely makes sense. So that's actually the academic terrain that I spend most of my time engaging with. And then when it comes to more like sociologists, I would say that's in the space of um, behavior change. How do we transform lifestyles? How do we create equitable cities where people's behavior starts to become part of a regenerative pattern and distributive pattern? So again, we've never pushed, we've never, we've never gone running after any particular discipline. It's who comes and get, engages with us, we engage back. And I have to say that on our platform, my colleague Andrew Fanning, who created those national donuts, he recently launched uh, two things. One is a list of all the academic research that's engaged with the donut. So if any students are thinking, I'd actually quite to like to use this for my dissertation, you can see everybody who's done a PhD using it in China or South Africa or in Wales or Scotland or a master's dissertation, but also we're publishing a set of research questions. I mean, I'm saying, you know, the shelves are empty. Well, here are some research questions. If any students are thinking, what kind of questions would be useful and build on on the existing knowledge, together with some wonderful thinkers like Julia Steinberger, Dan O'Neill, Andrew has brought many wonderful ecological and social econ economists in, and that's going to be published on our website very soon as well, inviting people of all different disciplinary backgrounds to, to get involved and adapt the ideas and use them or critique them or innovate on them and improve them. Thank you. Um, on that, you know, you've talked a lot about the bookshelves and there is a question here from one of our current fellows, Anam, who's saying, who's asking, and I'll read the question. It says, should we focus on the political struggle to end the empire that created this corrupt concept of growth-centered economy or focus on writing books for those blank shelves where we never had a place? Wow, great question. Great question. Well, I think it, I mean, I'm going to give the easy answer, which is it takes it all, right? And there are many kinds of people. And it would be terrible if the shelves remain empty. Of course, don't everybody come off the streets and go and sit in libraries and we give up the struggle because we're all writing books. I mean, that's crazy. But at the same time, <clears throat> as Danella Meadows would tell us, you know, if you want to bring about transformation in a system, Hang on. Uh, if we want to transform systems, there are many leverage points. And one of the highest leverage points is to change the goal of a system. <clears throat> and above that is to change the paradigm. And I, I didn't, I only discovered this by accident when I drew the donut. I saw the planetary boundaries and I drew another circle inside. Well, social boundaries, planetary boundaries. And we published it 10 years ago at Oxfam. And it had this massive impact in the world. I was amazed. It's just a picture. And that's changing the visual framing. <laughs> My voice has disappeared. This is such an important topic. Ideas really, really matter. Those first three pictures I showed, supply and demand and rational economic man and growth. We need new books, not because we need books, 
because we need the ideas that equip the next generation's minds. And I'm going to finish this comment with a quote from Paul Samuelson, who wrote the founding economics textbook in 1942, 1947. Economics. It's the mother of all economics textbooks that have ever been written. Paul Samuelson said, I don't care who writes a nation's laws or drafts its most advanced treaties, so long as I can write its economics textbooks. The first lick is the privileged one, impinging on the beginner's tabula rasa at its most impressionable state. Now, Paul Samuelson knew that the first ideas you show shape everything that follows. So we need ideas that represent humanity in the living world. We need ideas that decolonize our minds, that give us new imaginaries. We need ideas that show the injustices of history. We need metrics that make that injustice visible. Those national donuts I showed are an attempt towards that, but I still had to draw an arrow and write all these words, colonialism, military power. What kind of, what kind of metrics would make that visible? We need this because this informs the way we think and that informs whether or not we go to the streets at all. Uh, to me, you're, convert you're preaching to the converted because I just <laughs> completely agree with you in this sense of ideas matter and we need those um, new ideas. I'm mindful of the time and I also want to turn and, 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 and also Great. what's happening with your voice to give you a minute to rest and catch your breath. Mari, um, we have about five minutes and I wanted to, to give you a space again to reflect or to share anything in terms of what we've discussed in this Q&A. Yeah, there are two ideas that I, I, while I was listening to Kate, the first one is that this, um, this living world outside of our system is not just an hegemonic narrative in, in the economics. So when you, when you study uh, welfare state, you, you study the welfare state based on their, their uh, well, welfare triangle. And the welfare triangle, it's plays society, market, and a state. So the welfare state is based on this triangle. But uh, you know, the living world or or the, the the our ecosystem, our planet that is actually the basis of our, of our well-being and our welfare is not there. So, uh, and I've been reflecting about it since a uh, long time ago, but now that you say it compared with economics, again, it's, it's not just in economy, it's about, you know, the, this anthropocentric view. And again, it's not what the 20th century, and this is what uh, the economic, feminist economies also raise, it's not about all men, I mean, you know, 20th century, one the ideas that underpins all the, um, the paradigm, it's about a white man rich that acts like that. And that is not what the Western, is not the hegemonic view of the Western world, because we also are part of the Western world. And probably our indigenous people would not identify with such a view of about, about what humankind is, because they are more related with Earth, as you were mentioning, and with living in with the living world. So um, it's about for me, it's about raising, identifying this that this narrative that has been always been there. Thanks, Mari. I think this is this is a really important discussion that we're hitting upon about the narratives and the ideas and the systems we're living in and how difficult it is to think beyond that. And I want to um, thank you, Kate, for, for sharing your work with us and helping us to kind of push the boundaries of our thinking and to ask these questions. And I'm very happy that I was, that we're able to host you at the LSE, um, despite the fact that it didn't happen when your book um, came out six years ago. So we are now at the end of um, the time. I would like to thank um, Kate and Mari. It's been an absolute pleasure for me to chair today's events. Um, and thank you also to everyone in the audience who joined us. I know there were more questions that um, we didn't have time to, to, to ask, but 
I want to thank you for engaging with us. For those in the audience who would like to hear more about the International Inequalities Institute and the Atlantic Fellows for Social and Economic Equity, please follow the links in the chat function. And I'd like to add that the Atlantic Fellows for Social and Economic Equity program is currently recruiting for its next cohort of fellows, such as Mari was a couple of years ago. And if you are interested, please go to our website to find more information about the fellowship and how you can apply. So another huge thanks to our speakers, to the BSL interpreters, to all of the people in the background for helping organize this event and stay safe everyone and have a good rest of your day evening. Thank you, Amin. Thank I, you, Amin, for the invitation. Yeah, absolutely. And for great questions in the, in the in the conversation. I loved it. Fantastic. Good night.